you'd like to open your Bibles to 1 Kings 17. While I open in prayer. Father, I come before you this morning with heavy hearts, such as the tragic events of this past week. We thank you that we can find comfort and encouragement from you and in your word. And so we ask for that. I wouldn't want to hinder anything that you would want to reveal or say to your people. And so as we look to the scriptures this morning and individuals who lost children, we pray that the wonderful truths that you have recorded will be made evident in the great um, comfort we can receive from you. I Just use me as your vessel, Lord, to speak to your people this morning and minister to our hearts, especially to Jim and Chris and to Alex and Sophia. We thank you for the privilege of being able to worship you and think about what your son has done for us. Truly, that's the only reason we have for hope when terrible things happened. But it is a great hope that we have in Christ, Lord. And so we thank you for that. We pray for you to be pleased. We always want you to be worshiped during our service, but I might pray even more than normal that you would provide encouragement and comfort during this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of this morning's sermon is <clears throat> When a Child is Taken, Part 1. When a Child is Taken, Part 1, and the next Sunday will be Part 2 following the service for Brandon on Saturday. So after the events this past week, I didn't feel like I could come and preach the sermon that I had prepared on wisdom. I wanted to bring Scripture to bear on this situation, which meant, in my mind at least, looking at accounts in Scripture of individuals who lost children. And it occurs more often in Scripture than you might expect. There's at least five or six different accounts of parents losing children. We'll look at a few of them this morning and then next week. And I believe we see it more often in Scripture than you might expect because it can happen in life more often than we might expect. It's such a horror to us. Uh, Our minds don't even want to imagine it. But it is one of the worst realities associated with living in a fallen world. For those of us who haven't lost children that have been born, I know many of us have experienced miscarriages. And just to be absolutely clear about this, I don't think that uh, a miscarriage Um, while as painful or difficult as as it is compares with the loss that Jim and Chris or others have experienced um, when a child that they've loved or raised for some number of years is taken from them. But there is still an amount of grief and suffering that's associated with a miscarriage. And so my hope is, even if you haven't lost a child that's been born, that you can be encouraged by uh, God's Word and what this, um, what these verses would say to those of us. We've experienced two miscarriages ourselves. I remember sitting in the car driving home from the hospital with Katie, looking to her, um, seeing her sob, feeling unable to help her, and knowing that we needed to be encouraged through God's Word as well. We've had at least one woman here who's experienced three miscarriages during the third trimester. And so for all of us who've, who've been through that, I pray that these sermons would be an encouragement to you as well. Should you be fortunate enough to never lose a child through a miscarriage or any other respect, you are a member of the body of Christ, which obligates you to minister to your brothers and sisters. And so, if for no other reason, you need to know what God's Word says, so that should He call on you, and you have, which really is what it is, a privilege to come alongside people and be able to, in any small way, bear some of the pain that they're suffering, be equipped in that moment to do so. And so, what I'm saying is we all need to be familiar with what God's Word says, should we ever find ourselves in that opportunity to, to step alongside people who are suffering that kind of loss and uh, know how best to minister to them. And so I hope this morning's sermon and next Sunday's sermon accomplishes that as well. We know the Rayleighs have been through so much. What I wanted was for the sermon this morning and next Sunday to, to be an encouragement and not a discouragement. So it's uh, very personal to listen to a sermon about losing a child when you have lost a child. And so while I was concerned about the rest of our church family, my greatest concern was for the Rayleigh family. And so I did sit down and ask them ahead of time, I want you to be able to listen to this sermon freely without any nagging questions on your mind about how they're feeling about this. And I did talk to them and share with them what I had planned and wanted to know how they felt about that. And they wanted to hear these sermons preached for their own encouragement, but they also thought that they would be beneficial to the church family. So just receive God's word this morning, knowing that this, this first passed uh, by them as well. The sermon's going to be different than uh, actually any sermon I've ever preached, because I didn't look at any commentaries. I've never preached a sermon that I didn't look at any commentaries before. But the reason for that was I wanted this to be more devotional. 
I just wanted you to feel instead um, that I was preaching at you, that I was talking with you. I just want us to come together this morning. I just wanted to hear from God's Word. I didn't want this to be deeply theological or academic. I didn't want you to come and have to wrestle with any, you know, real uh, strong spiritual truths. I wanted you to feel as though God was speaking to, to you through His Word. And so to me, that meant to look through some of these passages and consider the devotional thoughts God have for me to give to you. So I did not even want to look at what any other men, I didn't look at any commentaries because I didn't want to see what any other men said about any of these verses. I didn't look at any of my previous notes on any of these verses. I just approached these verses with the prayer that God would deliver to me what he wanted to be delivered to you. And so that's my, has been my prayer, and I appreciate your prayer as I develop this, this next sermon, or even while I'm praying now, or preaching now, you can pray for me, that if there's something God would have me deliver this, not in my notes, that he would do that, and that he would speak to, to each of you. My heart is really for you to hear from him and, and not to hear from me. So hopefully you're in 1 Kings 17. Look with me at verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, this is her child, he became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him, and so he expired here. And the mother said to Elijah in verse 18, what have you against me? O man of God, you can see how angry or upset she is. She says, you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And so this woman just lost her son. Um, we can only imagine how she must have felt, and this brings us to lesson one. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to be upset. I want you to understand why certain accounts are recorded for us in Scripture. I told you many times before that the Bible contains imperatives, which are commands, or those things that are prescriptive, or prescribing something, or commanding us to do something, and there's also indicatives, where they indicate things. They're generally indicatives are going to be descriptive. They're going to be narratives, and they're not necessarily, they're not imperatives. They're not commanding anything. They're more records or accounts of things that have taken place, and in these narratives or in these indicatives, things are being described for us. We're often getting windows into the way people feel. We're given windows into their experiences, and their emotions. We're being shown their hurt, their grief, their suffering, their anger, their, their bitterness, their resentment, their confusion, their frustration, all of the different spectrum of emotions that we go through as human beings. We are shown that through different narratives and especially through the Psalms. And so I want us to understand why this account and the others like it is in Scripture and why it's not in Scripture. It's not in Scripture to tell us why this child died. You can read this entire account, and you can read the other account we're going to look at, and you can read the other accounts of children dying, and you don't get answers. We're not going to see a verse that's going to say, this child died for this reason, or God took this child for this reason. So that's not why this account is here. The account, and others like it, is here for us to identify with these people, and for God to be able to say that it's normal and natural to feel this way, that to be able to look at this mother who lost a child and see her pain and her grief, and for God to speak through her life through the pages of Scripture and say, it's completely reasonable to be upset like she is, and to be angry and to to be confused. Losing a child is got to be one of, if not the worst things that someone can experience on this side of heaven, and it's going to be accompanied by a a considerable amount, uh, not just of pain and suffering, but also anger, and you get to see that. You get to see through the way that this woman speaks. You get to see through what she says to Elijah, how she's feeling and how hurt she is. That's why there's descriptive accounts like this indicating what she's going through, because God wants to say it's okay to be upset. It's okay to feel this way. There are other parents who went through this. We have, I have recorded them for you in the pages of Scripture so that you can identify with them. Much of the Psalms, if you're reading the Psalms, you're going to get an amount of theology from them, but a lot of the Psalms are simply for you to be able to identify with the emotions that David or the other psalmist was going through at that time. 
I mean, what's the point of the book of uh, Lamentations? Yes, there's an amount of theology there for us to glean from it. But for the most part, you're just being able to identify with the prophet Jeremiah's anguish over the suffering that he saw his people experience. You don't need to look deeper than that. You don't, you don't need to find some hidden secret truth. It's just God's way of saying is a painful thing to go through. It's excruciating. Other people went through that. I have recorded their lives in Scripture for you that they might be an encouragement to you. Second, lesson two, God isn't punishing you. God isn't punishing you. I just want you to notice, if you look back at verse 18, this woman's words, first she says, what have you against me? Oh man, of God, she's upset. But then after that, she says, you have come to bring, you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. The mention of her sin in the verse is her way of saying that she thinks she's being punished. She thinks that this has happened because of some sin that she has committed in her life. And really, I mean, to lose a child is terrible enough. One of the only things that can make it worse was, would be to think that it's happening because God is punishing you, because you have done something wrong. And you see that with this woman. That's what she thought. And the point is, she hadn't done anything wrong. She wasn't being punished. God was not upset with her. He was not disciplining her. She wasn't going through this because of some mistake or sin or transgression that she had committed in her life. It's terrible to suffer the loss of a child, but then to feel as though you did something to contribute to that would just be really an unspeakable horror. So anybody, whether they've lost a child that's been born or whether they're experiencing a miscarriage, might have to work hard to resist that temptation to think that they had done something that had brought this about. God wasn't punishing this woman, and God isn't punishing any other parents when they lose children. A close secondary temptation, if people aren't convinced at times that God is punishing them, is for them to punish themselves. And typically, that looks like playing all the what-ifs or all the different scenarios. This mother was wondering if this was her fault, and she's blaming herself. And parents do this when they start saying, well, what if I would have done this instead, or what if I hadn't done that, or what if I would have taught my child this, or what if I would have given my child this instruction, or what if I would have been here? If you just imagine for a moment, perhaps, a child that was, was hit by a car and all the different scenarios that parents might play through in their minds, well, what if I would have done this? What if we would have lived someplace else? What if we hadn't been that close to the road? What if we had been there? What if I hadn't let him go there? What if I hadn't let her play with those people? Or what if, and, then, and as they go through this, this is a way for parents to punish themselves as they play through all those different scenarios. And I just want to tell you as your pastor, it's a, it's a temptation that has to be resisted. It, it takes the agony and it just increases it exponentially. You can't, you can't keep playing out those scenarios. You have to let them go. And you have to believe that it wasn't your fault and that there wasn't something that you could have or should have done differently and, and you're not a bad parent and none of us are going to, we can't shelter our children. We can't just lock them up in, the, in our home or put, a, you know, put them in the closet and never let them experience any of life. And when terrible things happen to our children, I mean, Joey Donaldson recently falling out of that tree some number of feet to the ground, thank God that he, he didn't end up being killed, but our children are going to go out and they're going to live their lives. And we're only increasing our agony to play through all those different scenarios. It's a form of punishing ourselves that we need to do our best to resist. Look at verse 19. Elijah said to her, he said, give me your son. I mean, just such a tender moment here. And he took him from her arms and he carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and he laid him on his own bed. One of the difficulties with Scripture at times is determining tone or the way that things are said. If it tells you how someone said it, then you understand the tone. But if it doesn't tell you that, you're forced to guess. And I think when Elijah said this, he said this very tenderly to the woman when he said, give me your son. He lived with them. He could have lived with them for upwards of three, three and a half years. He cared for this woman. And I don't mean he cared for her emotionally and relationally, although, that, although he did that, I mean, he literally cared for her and provided for her. There was a, there was a drought, 
that then led to a famine, and he was the one who provided for them. She lived because of him. And so he, they had a close, intimate relationship. I mean, being in the same home like this. And I'm sure that this was painful for him. And so when he says to her, give me your son, and he takes her, her son, by the arms and carries him up, this brings us to lesson three. Jesus takes believing children in his arms. Scripture, for as important as heaven is, it, do, it doesn't give us the greatest window into what heaven's going to be like. I mean, for the number of chapters that are in God's Word, we can't describe in too much detail what heaven is like. We have some, some detail, but not a lot. And so you're almost forced to wonder what the Lord is like in heaven. I mean, we're going to be with Him for eternity. And what I would say is, if you want to know what the Lord is like on heaven, you look at the Lord on earth. If you want to know what it's going to be like to be with your Savior for eternity, you look at what your Savior was like during His earthly ministry. You read the Gospels. I see no reason to think that Jesus would be any different in heaven than He's been on earth, especially if Hebrews 13.8 says that Jesus Christ is what? The same, yeah, yesterday and today and forever. So I believe that while He'll be in His glorified form and, and there will be some differences, we'll, see, we'll still see the same compassion and tenderness and kindness that we see from our Savior when he was on the earth. When we were at the hospital on Wednesday night, on more than one occasion, people said to Jim and Chris to encourage them, Brandon is in Jesus' arms. And there were some times that I heard Brandon and Chris telling each other, or tell Jim and Chris telling each other that Brandon was in Jesus' arms. And I don't think that that's an overly sentimental thought. I think that's a thought that has considerable biblical support for it. I think it's really one of the most beautiful images or considerations we should have. I appreciated Jim and Chris being told that, and I appreciated Jim and Chris telling each other that. And the reason I say that is I think God wants us to have that image because that's the image we have of our Savior when he was on the earth. So it's not sentimental to tell ourselves things that are supported by Scripture, it isn't sentimental to think things that God has revealed to us and wants us to take in our understanding of the Lord. And so when I share about Jesus taking up a child in his arms, this is actually a part of the sermon that is not a devotional thought. We have moved beyond devotion to substance, to truth. Multiple times in the Gospels, I'll just use one Gospel, Mark, 936, Jesus took a child and taking him in his arms, he said to them. You go to the next chapter, Mark 10, verse 16. Jesus took the children, multiple, in his arms and blessed them. I didn't add anything to this verse. I didn't interpret it. I read what it said. And so when I look at verse 19, and Elijah says, give me your son, And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged. You know, my my mind goes to Christ and what he did with children. And there were some foolish decisions that the disciples made, times that they had to be rebuked, and that was one of them. I don't, I mean, in all of Jesus' kindness and graciousness, I don't think he leaned toward a critical spirit. So for him to rebuke had to have been fairly serious. And he rebuked the disciples. That was one time he did. They tried to forbid parents from bringing children to him. And he turned to the disciples and he criticized them for that and commanded them to let the little children be brought to him. And he picked them up. He carried them in his arms. And if he would take children in his arms during his earthly life, why would we think that he wouldn't do the same in heaven? If we would think that this is what Jesus wants us to see of him, during his earthly ministry, why would we think that that ministry would not continue in heaven? So I love the language of this verse. I love the language of this verse. Give me your son, and he takes the child in his arms, and he carries him up into the upper chamber where he lodges, or where he resides, or where Christ resides in heaven. If you ever lose a child, you might turn back to this verse. Read it as many times as you need to, to be encouraged by the imagery it creates of our Lord. 
Look with me at verse 20. Elijah cried to the Lord. He did love this woman and he loved the child. He cried to the Lord and he said, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? And then he stretched himself upon the child three times and he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house. And then another very tender moment here where he delivers the child back to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Now obviously this account and the other ones we're going to look at break down at one of the most important points that this child was raised from the dead and multiple other children in Scripture were raised from the dead. But children in our lives aren't raised from the dead. And so this needs to be addressed. You can almost start to wonder why these accounts are recorded in Scripture. I mean, are they to, to give people false hope? And I want to share something with you that I, for many people can be um, practically a paradigm shift in their understanding of God, in their understanding of theology, and in, in their understanding of Scripture in general. I think this is a very important point. I think that people's failure, especially false teachers or health and wealth um, preachers, have, uh, I don't know whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether for their own profit have missed the, this point that is of such great importance. And so please hear me when I say this. The pictures in Scripture or the physical uh, um, miracles that took place portray spiritual realities to us. Let me say that one more time. When the miraculous or the supernatural takes place in Scripture, it's not meant to communicate to us that God is going to do that exact same thing physically in every situation but it is portraying a spiritual reality that he accomplishes in the lives of his believers. Let's just use Jesus' um, ministry as an example. When Jesus healed blindness, what's going on there? Is it meant to teach us that every time someone is blind, God is going to heal that person's blindness? No, that's not what's going on there. (laughs) It's meant to portray the spiritual reality that God wants to heal our what? Our spiritual blindness. So we might see and understand spiritual truths. When, when the Lord healed deafness, is that to make us think that any time someone's deaf, the Lord is going to heal that? And there are people that say that. I mean, there are people that should there be a child that's deaf or someone else, and they're going to stand before the church, and they're going to say, look at these verses where the Lord healed deafness. He wants to heal this child's deafness. That's not going on there. That makes people false teachers. What's happening is it's revealing the Lord's desire to heal spiritual deafness so that we can hear spiritual truths. In Jesus' day when he was preaching, there were plenty of people who could hear physically, but they couldn't what? They couldn't hear spiritually. They didn't understand. They would have been so much better off to have lost their physical hearing and been deaf it would, if it would have given them spiritual hearing and allowed them, allowed them to understand the truths that he was teaching. And so these physical, the supernatural and the miracles are performed physically or wonderfully or beautifully illustrative of what the Lord wants to do spiritually. When Jesus heals a paralytic, should someone be paralyzed? Are you going to go to the account of the paralyzed man being lowered through the roof and say, Jesus wants to heal this person's paralysis? No, but it is a picture of how he wants to heal our spiritual paralysis so that we can walk with the Lord or in the, or in the language of Romans 6, 4, that we would walk in newness of life. What about when Jesus raised people from the dead? It is not to make us think that he's going to raise every person from the dead when they die. But it is a beautiful picture of the spiritual reality when Lazarus is brought forth from the grave I don't know that you can have a better picture of resurrection, and I don't mean physical resurrection, of spiritual resurrection, even though it takes place physically in all of Scripture. The spiritual application is what we need to look for behind these physical realities, and this brings us to lesson four. Jesus will raise believing children. Jesus will raise believing children. I do want to make an important point here. I wish I would have said this in the first service. Someone actually shared it with me, and I appreciated it. 
I'm, I'm convinced, sentimentally, we all want to think if there's a miscarriage or an infant dies, that that child goes to heaven. But let me say, it's not enough to be sentimental. Sentimenta- we, can't, we cannot live our lives or build our theology on sentimentality. I'm convinced infants go to heaven because of what Scripture teaches. I mean, it would be an entirely other sermon. It's been a series that I've taught here a few times during Sunday school. I think there is considerable scriptural evidence that if you have any questions about this, you can come and talk to me. I can give you my notes, or, or I can point you toward those messages if you'd like to listen to, um, convincing biblically that infants, or especially ch- children in the womb who perish, do find themselves immediately in the presence of the Lord. But now we're talking about children. We've moved beyond infants, and we're talking about children. And believing children will be raised. Believing children will be raised. Here's what I love to be able to tell any people who have lost children. God is going to raise your child from the dead this moment. Look at what Elijah did. Look at what Elisha did. Look at what Jesus did. And he's going to raise your child from the dead this moment. The problem is, that's, not, that's just not true. I mean, can you imagine what I would have loved to have been able to say on Wednesday night more than anything else? I mean, if that was the only thing I could offer that night, what, what, how incredible that would have been able to be able to communicate that to Jim and Chris. Here's what I can communicate. Here's what is true. When a child is a believer... God is going to raise that child from the dead to eternal life. And I don't know many things that are more encouraging for parents to consider. I don't know that there are many things that are more important for parents to keep in mind than that reality that God raises believing children to eternal life. And if nothing else, I mean, if there's anything, I'll talk a little bit more about this toward the end of the sermon, good that God brings forth from this. I hope that it... it, it encourages all of us to be like Jim and Chris and preach the gospel to our children. I mean, I was thrilled to hear about Brandon's um, evidences of salvation and to know that they had, you know, committed the, the years of his life to hearing about Christ and, and learning the gospel. And so if you're a parent, I hope the tragedy of this past week, if it does at least one thing in our lives, it is to encourage us to preach the gospel to our children. I had never imagined that I would share the gospel as much as I do during our family worship. And if you're a father and you gather your family around the Word and you feel like we just talked about the gospel in our previous Bible study and the one before that and the one before that, I would say then talk about it again if your kids want to talk about it. And if it is just Bible study after family Bible study after family worship, discussing the gospel, and that's what your children have questions about, and that's, then that's what you feed them. That's what you give them as many times as they want to hear it. Turn to 2 Kings 4 for the next account. A few chapters to the right. Second Kings 4, we'll look at verse 18. When the prophet Elisha, who followed the prophet Elijah, experienced something similar. When the child had grown... He went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. And the father said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had lifted him and brought him to his mother, the child sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. I can't imagine how devastating this must have been for her. She went up, and she laid him on the bed of the man of God, and she shut the door behind him, and she went out. I want to give you this next lesson before we read the verses because I want you to look for it as we go through the verses. Let me say one more time. I'm going to give you the lesson, and then I want you to look for the truth of this lesson. I want you to see it as we read through the verses. And the lesson is this. Go to the Lord with your loss. Lesson five, go to the Lord with your loss. As we look at these verses, I was moved by the woman's tenacity. I was moved with her, by her um, persistence to reach the man of God in her life, which is what Elisha is repeatedly called. And I'll just tell you that when I read these verses, I could not help but think how well we would do to pursue Christ with the same tenacity and persistence when we suffer loss 
as we see this woman do with the prophet Elijah. And the prophet Elijah, he's called man of God repeatedly, tremendous. But how much greater is Christ? I mean, if this woman is going to pursue Elisha like she did, how much more should we pursue Christ when we're suffering and hurting? Look with me at verse 22 to see her example. She called to her husband and she said, send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may go quickly to the man of God and come back again. So she says she wants to go see the prophet. And her husband said, why will you go to him today? It's neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said all is well, so she's not going to let her husband turn her away. Verse 24, she saddled the donkey. She said to her servant, urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out. She came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. And when the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there is the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, so Elijah sees her coming, sends a servant Gehazi to her and to say, is all well with you? Is everything okay? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered, and she said, all is well. So she's not going to be discouraged. She's not going to be deterred by this servant either. Gehazi reaches her, starts pressing her with these questions, and she doesn't have time for him either. She's just going to race right. She's not going to get caught up in dialoguing with him. She's going to race right past him to reach Elisha. Verse 27, when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, look at this, she caught hold of his feet. I mean, she literally clung to him. She literally falls to the ground. She just wraps her arms around his legs, like we need to do with Christ, or we need to cling to him with the same persistence. And Gehazi came, and Gehazi's trying to push her away. He almost looks like the disciples, you know, with the children, trying to push the parents away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is in bitter distress, and the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. And so she wasn't going to be turned away even by this servant. We must not be turned away when, when we suffer loss and we turn to Christ or pursue him. And she knew she couldn't get help anywhere else. Now, I want to say this with, with an amount of balance. If a couple lost a child there wouldn't be too many things that would be more important for them during that season than their marriage relationship to, to cling to each other and to look to each other for, in comfort, for comfort and encouragement. But the one thing that would be more important even than that is looking to Christ. And what I see with this woman is I see a woman who, who would not even turn to her husband. There was an amount of comfort and encouragement I'm sure she was going to receive from her husband. But she looked past him. She looked to Christ. She knew she wasn't going to get what she needed even from him, from her husband. So you need your spouse if you lose a child. You need your spouse if you're going through something terrible. You need your church family. I mean, it's just, which is say you need your brothers and sisters in Christ, maybe more than any other time. But the one thing that you need more than anything else is the Lord himself. Consider these verses, Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. Only the Lord can do that. What, I mean, it says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the crushed in spirit. Spouse can't do that. Children can't do that. Parents can't do that. Friends can't do that. Brothers and sisters in Christ can't do that. Psalm 147, 3. Christ heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. And that's speaking of spiritual wounds. Only the Lord can heal the brokenhearted. Only he can bind up the spiritual and emotional wounds that they're experiencing. Now, I don't know if this sounds at all perhaps even discouraging. You listen and think, well, can't I, can't I do more? I mean, we play a very important part in this. I can't remember if Pastor Nathan said it at this service or just at first service during announcements. The, the very important part that we as the Rayleigh's church family play in springing into action to love and support them. And I at least heard Pastor Nathan say during the first service how blessed he was to be part of a church that was doing that. And that's my thought, too. If there's one consolation when I've been with people, when they've been experiencing great loss, second only to them knowing Christ, is my thought that they know this church. Because I, I, I do. I really have that much confidence in all of you. It's a wonderful blessing. I don't know if I communicate this enough, but it is a tremendous blessing to me as your pastor to know that the church family is going to rally around. The church that I'm blessed to pastor is going to rally around these people who are suffering. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a pastor and think the church family is not going to spring into action for these people. I've never, that thought has never crossed my mind. What has crossed my mind is how much is, the family going, is our church family going to do to love and support these people, in this case the Rayleighs, 
while they're going through this. So I'm not minimizing or downplaying the responsibility that we have or the wonderful ways that you're ministering to them, but there's a ceiling on what we can do where only the Lord can truly help people beyond what, what um, we're able to provide. And so it could sound discouraging that we can't do more, but it, there's an amount of freedom in it for us. It's somewhat encouraging or liberating for me as a pastor to feel like I don't have to try to take on the responsibility that the Lord has in this person's life. I, I am not responsible with doing for these people what Christ can do, what Christ is doing. I mean, if I thought I had to do that, I don't think I could show up at a hospital. I don't think I could come alongside someone if I thought I was going to have to take Christ's place. And so be encouraged. If you've ever thought, and I mean, people have asked me this many times, they'll know someone who's suffering. It could be someone in our church, or it could be a friend or family member of theirs, and they'll say, I, I'm so burdened for them. I want to do something. I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And usually, my sentiment to them is, then you're in a perfectly fine place. Just go and don't say anything. <laughs> if you don't say anything, you probably won't have any trouble. The best thing, that, one of the best things you can do, the second best thing, and I'll talk about the first best thing in a second, the second best thing you can do is just go and be with people and just be there, and that's all that most people want. I can, I can honestly tell you that in the times I've been with people in California or in Washington, and in, Cal, in California there was some uh, family, I remember this, this family, they lost their daughter, young daughter, to a brain tumor. And in, that's one that stands out. And in all these situations, in 13 years of pastoral ministry, I'm per, sure not as many as some pastors have experienced, but I've never had anyone ask me why this happened to them. I've never had to answer that question. You don't need to go into a situation having to be God himself and explain why these things are happening. People aren't looking to you for that. They're just looking for you to be with them and to pray with them. They're not looking for you to answer the questions that they have because we don't have the answers for those questions. Just to go and to, to be with them is, is what's most important. Try, and you can, try, you can try to read people and see what they want. For us, when we were, I mean, when, Job, when, when, were, when were Job's friends getting it right? <laughs> At the beginning when they were quiet. When did they start messing it up? You know, when they started talking and they've offered all their cliches and platitudes. You don't need a whole bunch of wisdom to go and be with people who are suffering. If you, I would recommend have a couple psalms chosen in mind that you might share if they ask for them. And if you pray, just share from your heart with them. And read people, see what they want. When we were at the hospital the other night, when Jim walked out and he came toward us, he looked like he just wanted to be held. And so Pastor Nathan and I just stood there and held him as long as he wanted while he sobbed on us. And we didn't say anything. And then the nurse came out and she said to me, is there anything you'd like? And I said, may I see Chris if she'd like to see me? And he said, I'll bring you back. And then we walked into the room and Chris was sitting in this chair. And I just walked up and I threw my arms around her. And then she sobbed on me for a long time. And then she held my hand and I put my arm around her. There wasn't anything else I could give her. I think Pastor Nathan and I might have been there for two hours before either of us said anything. So just go and be with people. Sit with them, put your arm around them, hold their hand or let them hold your hand. If they want you to share verses with them, read verses. If they want you to pray with them, pray with them. And even when you do that, you're doing the very best thing because you're doing what we're talking about. You're pointing them to Christ. You're pointing them to the only person who can truly help or encourage or comfort them in that moment. And I will offer one other counsel to you. Don't share about any loss you've experienced when you're with people who are suffering. You're not going to encourage them by telling them how you've suffered. Or let me just make it like this, and I don't want to sound insensitive, but nothing is about you at that moment. Don't make anything about you. When people are hurting, that's not the time to share your testimony about the time you were hurting. All of the air in that room needs to go to those people. If someone does ask you to share something, 
don't share something that is not the exact same. Here's what I mean. If someone loses a child, don't talk about when you lost your grandparent. Don't even talk about when you lost your parent or your sibling because that's not how it goes. The way it goes is you get older and you lose your grandparents and then you lose your parents and then your children lose you, you don't lose them. Never go into a situation with people who have lost children and talk to them about any loss you've ever experienced unless you've also lost a child. And never say the words, I know what you're going through, because you don't. It is not a time to bring any attention to yourself. It is a time to give all of the emotion and energy that is available and grief to those people and for you to just be there and, and put your arms around them and sob with them, pray with them if they ask for that, and read any verses if they would like that. And that's the greatest help you can offer because you're pointing them to Christ. When I'm with people who are hurting, I'm either sitting quietly or I'm seeing if they want me to read verses or pray with them. There's not one single time that I can ever think that I've offered anything profound because nobody's ever asked for anything profound. So if you're ever wondering what you can do to help people, just go there and be with them. Look at verse 28. Then she said, Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And this brings us to lesson six. You can be confused. You can be confused. I remember when my brother passed away, and I wasn't a Christian at that time. And again, I don't think that uh, losing a brother, as I did, compares with the loss of a child. And I say that as a father of eight. I mean, it was terrible to lose my brother, but I would, I, I mean, I can't imagine how much worse it would be to lose a child. And I just, I'm, I'm, pro I'm probably being a little overly sensitive. It probably wasn't this bad. But it just seemed to me like everyone knew why my brother died. Everyone just kept coming and telling me why it happened. Everyone had all these answers. I mean, it's astonishing how ultra-spiritual everyone was to come and tell me God did this for that reason, and he did it for this reason, and, and this is why your brother died, and this and that, and this and that. And it's like, I couldn't get away from it. All I wanted, I, I went, I took, I got the news on a Wednesday night, uh, stayed at home on a Thursday. That was the worst day of my life, and I went back to school on Friday because I needed something to escape the feeling. And, you know, People grieve differently. We'll talk about this next week. For me, I wanted to get back to work, and I wanted my mind consumed with something. Going back to work could have been a very bad decision on my part because I was just overwhelmed by all these people coming and preaching to me, telling me why all this stuff happened. And I wanted to just lock myself in my classroom with my students. There was one person, Holly Simmons. Her father was the pastor of the church where I ended up getting saved a few months later when she and Elwin invited me to that church. She gave me a letter, and she wrote out her thoughts. And the beginning of the letter, the first and second sentence said, I don't know why this happened, but I'm so sorry. I have no idea why you're going through this, but I'm so sorry. And I could not have read anything more perfect at that time. I didn't need all the platitudes and cliches and wisdom that people thought they had to share with me. It was just nice and refreshing for someone to tell me I don't know why this happened because I was so confused. And I'm mentioning this because look at this woman in verse 28. Look at what she's going through. She says, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say do not deceive me? She's confused. Why is this recorded for us? Why is this here? Why do you get to look down and see that this woman felt this way? Is there any deep theological insight or truth into this verse? There's not. Don't look deeper than that. This is just God's way of saying people are confused when they lose children. You can be confused if you lose a child. That's all this is communicating. This woman, how many parents do you think have felt like this woman when she says, why did you give me a child if you were just going to take that child from me? I remember I thought that with our miscarriages. I was going over this sermon with Katie, and she said, I remember that. I remember that very question. We had two miscarriages. They weren't particularly late in the pregnancy. I'm not saying that they were 
um, that it approaches the, you know, the grief or suffering some people have experienced. But for us, you know, we were wondering why it happened. We were driving home. Katie sobbing in the seat next to me as her husband. It was, I mean, what do we want to do as husbands? We f- want to fix everything. That's what we do. As men, we fix things. And that was one time. I just remember I was sitting there and I thought, you know what? I thought two things. I thought, this is affecting my wife differently than it's affecting me. I'm grieved and I'm suffering, but she is suffering in a completely different way than I am. And I just tend to think that when women have carried children, as husbands, we need to acknowledge that there's something that they go through that's different for them than for us. I don't mean to sound at all insensitive to any husbands here as a husband myself, but I think as husbands, we need to appreciate that there is a different grief that women experience. And I realized that that day, driving home from the hospital, I, I hate what I'm experiencing right now to lose this child, but I know that it is worse for Katie. I know that she's going through something right now that I can't appreciate. And the other thing I thought was, I can't do anything about this. I can't fix this. I've been able to try to fix other things in our marriage. It was our second child that we'll see someday in heaven between Ray and Ricky. But I, so we hadn't been married that long, but I thought, I can't do anything. I was searching, you know, my mind. What can I do here, Lord? What, how can I make this better? There's nothing I could do to make this better. My point is, it was very confusing Lord, why is this happening? Why did you let Katie get pregnant in the first place if you're just going to take this child from us? And so, this is not here in Scripture for any other reason than to tell us it's okay to be confused. It's okay to not have answers. One of the major points of the book of Job is that you don't get answers to suffering. Nobody should ever write a book and explain why suffering takes place other than we live in a fallen world because nobody knows job is that book and one of the main points of the book is you you're if you didn't know job as you read through it he wants all these answers and he wants his day in court and he wants to hear from the lord if you didn't know the end of it you're expecting god to show up and tell him why all this is happening to him and god doesn't he didn't owe job any explanation and we don't get explanations either And that's one of the main lessons to take away from the book. And we just have to accept that there are these confusing, painful, terrible situations that happen in a fallen world. And we aren't going to be able to find out at this time why they occur. Consider these verses. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, in this life, I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And these, these verses are making the appropriate point that we don't know everything. There are secrets that belong only to God, and we only see dimly or partially right now. There's much that, that hasn't been revealed to us. And we'll take these verses, and here's how we'll apply them. And this is an appropriate, this is an appropriate application of them. There'll be a, a theological conflict. You know, you're looking at God's sovereignty, and the free moral agency of man, and you can't reconcile them. And you say, well, I know the Bible says that God is sovereign, and I know that man is a free moral agent, but these seem to be mutually exclusive or irreconcilable. If God is sovereign, or which is to say absolutely and completely in control of everything, man must not be a free moral agent. Well, man is a free moral agent, so God must not be absolutely sovereign. But then you say, you know what? The Bible presents both. The sacred things belong to the Lord. I only see dimly. You know, this is partial sight on my part. I know they're both true, and that's how we apply these verses. One of the other applications of these verses, they don't receive as much attention this way, although I think they should, relates to God's will over suffering. Things happen in our lives that we don't understand. They're confusing, and the secrets associated with them, all the questions belong to the Lord, or the answers do. I don't think there are many things that are more confusing than children's deaths So there aren't many more times that we need to embrace these verses and say the secret things, the secret details, the the answers to these questions, they belong to the Lord. I can only see dimly. I only know in part. I don't know why these tragedies happened. I don't know why there's this diagnosis. I don't know why there's this loss. I don't know why there's this sickness. I don't know why there's this. I don't know why there's that. I mean, I know I live in a fallen world, but I don't know any more than that. And these accounts with this woman are recorded so we can accept that and see that it's completely fine to be confused and upset. The events of the past week, uh, terribly tragic, confusing, 
for uh, two churches. I was on the phone yesterday with pastors Randy and James, who were the, the lead pastor and the children's pastor at Ridgeville Nazarene. Pastor Randy, the one who, who drowned courageously trying to save the children. Um, I mean, if, if I can even just for one moment draw a little attention to this man's heroic act, it isn't too much to say that he did sacrifice himself trying to save these children. He was in there at the end uh, with Brandon. Brandon was not alone. He had Pastor Andy with him. I hope that that might be some solace or comfort to the Rayleigh family that I know Ridgefield Nazarene want to pass along if that hasn't been passed along yet. But in those final moments, Brandon was not alone. And I don't mean just the Lord was with him. I mean, he had a pastor with him. Pastor Andy was with him. He was fighting to the last moment to be able to save him. Now, to me, I don't think that there are many things that are more heroic. And this is the only attention that I ever get, am able to give to Pastor Andy that I'm thankful for this opportunity. Uh, we should be praying for his wife and his family as well, following their loss. But the point is, that church is grieving, our church is grieving, all of this pain and turmoil. And when Pastor Nathan and I were driving to the hospital, and when we drove back, there were two times that we had the same conversation. And the conversation between us was, God's going to bring forth good from this. Now, to be candid with you, we couldn't see it. I mean, to be even more candid with you, I still have trouble seeing it. I think it would be very arrogant for me to say, this is the good God is doing, because I don't know. But what do I know? Because Scripture tells me that there is good God is doing. Romans 8.28 says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. I mean, mean, all things. It It doesn't say just small things or just large things. It doesn't say just good things work together for good. When it says all things work together for good, that means even the worst, most horrible, horrific circumstances, God is working those together for good in the lives of His believers. The only, the only issue is that our good isn't always the same as God's good. What we think is good or what we would like to see isn't always the good that God is doing, but we can be encouraged that there's good God's doing. And people, they'll quote this verse and they'll say, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. And they kind of stop, they kind of just give you the half of the verse that all things work together for good. And they're leaving off the important part that this is in the lives of believers that God is doing this. It says, we know that for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, that's referring to saints, as James was sharing during communion. And that needs to be considered, that this is for people who have repented of their faith and put their, or repented of their sins and put their faith in Christ. And so it still leaves the question, what's the good that God is doing from this? Again, I can't, I can't say certainly, but I will offer this one thing that I think I see in this situation and I see in every situation when there's death, and it's this. It's an important reminder for us. Every single death, as as painful or terrible as it is, brings something front and center to us that we all need to be reminded of often. Because if you just think about it, what do we want to do with death? I mean, simply put, we just want to keep it as far away from us as possible, don't we? I don't mean like we want to put it far in the future, that's, although that's true, and hope that we don't die for some decades or centuries. That's true. I mean, we, do, we want to keep it far from us. We don't want it in conversations. We don't want to talk about it over dinner. We don't want to get together with friends and have Bible studies about death. And it's understandable. I'm not, I'm not condemning that feeling. But we need to be reminded of death. It is a reality that faces all of us, that all of us are heading toward. It's not the most pleasant thing to consider, but it is something that we should consider. At least Jonathan Edwards said he made it a point to consider it every single day. There were things Jonathan Edwards wanted to live by, and one of those things was that every single day he would consider that he was going to die so he could live in light of that. And this brings us to our last lesson. Death reminds us life is temporary. Every death is tragic. We, it's not, death is uncomfortable. I don't mean it's uncomfortable to talk about, although that's true. I just mean it doesn't feel right. 
It just doesn't feel right. And it shouldn't feel right. I think it's Ecclesiastes 3.11. It says that God has built eternity into our hearts. So death is going to be a very foreign, if you want to say entity or enemy to us, which is how death is presented in Scripture. If you want to go and turn to 1 Corinthians 15, so the last place we looked this morning, I'll show you some verses discussing this. Death, death seems so, so foreign or bizarre or cruel or any number of other adjectives we could bring to describe it because it wasn't God's original plan for us. The original plan was Adam and Eve and then their children would live on eternally. Death was introduced, and so it seems foreign to us. What I would encourage you to see is that death is an enemy, and I don't want you to just think of that because that's my opinion, and I say, oh, death is something you should hate, so consider it an enemy. I want you to consider death as an enemy because that's how death is presented in Scripture as an enemy, that we have been given victory over through Christ. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And so the, the bad news is that we all face death. The good news is that Christ has given victory, given us victory over it. Skip down to verse 54 to see these wonderful verses. Paul says, so when this corruptible, this is referring to our earthly bodies as, you, as we get older and we age or a sickness or illness afflicts us, we do recognize how corruptible or frail or fragile our bodies are. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, when these frail, fragile bodies of ours have put on incorruption, when they will no longer break down, when they will no longer be frail or fragile or experience any of the afflictions that we experience on this side of heaven, or referring basically to when we get glorified bodies, this mortal, this mortal body, will have put on immortality, referring to eternal life we receive. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? In other words, death can no longer hurt us. O Hades, where is your victory? Again, Hades is another way to refer to death, and it's to say that it has no victory over us. Verse 57, but thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in most Bibles, you'll see that death is capitalized. Why is death capitalized? It could even, st raise your hand if death is capitalized in your Bible. Is it capitalized in ESV? Okay, in many Bibles, it's capitalized. And you could say, well, why is death Because it's being personified. God wants so much for you to see death as, as an enemy that it becomes an entity or an enemy that can be defeated, and so he personifies it. And if, and if you really want to know how strongly God wants you to view death as an enemy that you have victory over, guess what God does with death? He puts it to death. He sends it to hell. <laughs> Revelation 20, verse 14, death is cast into the lake of fire. You've got death going to hell. You've got death dying. Well, you, I mean, that's kind of wild to consider, but why would it say that? Because God wants you to be that confident over the victory that is yours in Christ, that he has accomplished on your behalf. When, and when do we need to think about this? I mean, we can be like Jonathan Edwards. We can think about it every day, and perhaps we should. But we especially need to think about it when there's tragedies like this. This is the only way to be encouraged, is to think about what Christ has done for us. I want to close with this. Be comforted that Jesus has risen from the grave. Be comforted that Christ's death means the death of death. We can be thankful despite the heaviness of our hearts and all that we're experiencing for this family that we love. We can still be thankful for what Christ has done for us. I think that's the only way to have any encouragement or comfort during this time. We can be thankful for Christ and we can be thankful for the God who comforts and saves and heals through what his son has done. Father, we thank you for that reality, and we pray for Jim and Chris. We pray for Alex and Sophia. We lift them up to you, Lord. I, I ask on behalf of the church that they would constantly, which I do believe has been the case, come to mind for us so we can continue, continually lift them up in prayer, individually as family, should we wake up in the middle of the night that we would offer a prayer for them, that you would draw them close to yourself and comfort and encourage them. Help us as a church to love and support them during this time. 
I pray for this tragedy, Lord, that you would bring forth good from it. We do thank you for that truth, even if we can't see it. I pray even now for the prayer meeting tonight, that it can be an encouragement to the Raleys, but really to all of us. We thank you for Christ and what he has done for us. And now more than any other time, Lord, we need to have our eyes set on him and appreciating the temporal nature of this life, that this is not our home, that you did not build us for this, that you built us for heaven with you. And so we thank you for that reality that we can experience because of what your son has done for us. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.